Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for watching my channel. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of your support on Patreon and buying stuff from the Gun Guy TV store and all the things that you do. Thank you very, very much. This video is about the proposed regulations recently released by the California Department of Justice. I will try to keep it as, as concise as I can, but you'll notice that I'm sitting comfortably in my office. I have my coffee and, uh, you know, I... <laughs> Be prepared, right? Look, a lot of this stuff, and since I have my coffee, um, a lot of this stuff that they released, again, in proposed regulations is precisely the same as the stuff they released before and then later had to withdraw because of all the pressure they were getting. They haven't changed a thing. I, I can't figure out why they just held on to it for months and months and months and months. Uh, there's my phone going off. I had hoped that, uh, frankly, they would make some common sense changes to these. Common sense is not all that common, obviously, but they didn't. So since they are almost exactly the same, I'm not going to go over them in great detail here because I've already done it in previous videos. So I'm going to put the links to those videos in the description. You can check them out there. If you don't already, if you haven't already gone through all of that and you want to do that, please feel free. I'll also put the links to the California Rifle and Pistol Association webinars, which are outstanding they're just really, really long. Uh, the one I went through yesterday trying to parse some of this stuff was an hour and almost an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, you got to go through it if you want to know what the laws are. So I did. And I'm going to try to encapsulate uh, some of that stuff into a smaller program for you today. But again, I'm just going to go over the highlights. I'm not going to go over the, the minutia that I've already done. So check out those links in the description for the detail. Uh, you can tell how lengthy some of the stuff is if I look at the number of pages of notes and printouts and like that that I had to sift through uh, just to do this for you and then read through the actual statute itself, which is a yawn or two. But there are some really interesting high points. So here's a few. And this one I talked to uh, you about before and let you know, and that is there's a couple of kinds of guns uh, that long arms that were not included in any of this by the legislature. One is rim fires. Any rim fire gun is not a uh, considered an assault weapon in the state of California by statute. And the other are shotguns, uh, semi-automatic shotguns, which are capable of accepting a detachable magazine, uh, have been required to have a bullet button for quite some time. And guns like the Sega or Saiga or however you want to say it are perfectly legal with a bullet button. And even though bullet button equipped center fire rifles now must be either altered to be featureless, taken out of the state or registered as assault weapons, None of that applies to bullet button equipped semi-automatic shotguns because the legislature did not make any changes with regard to shotguns. Nevertheless, the California Department of Justice is trying very hard to include shotguns in all of this, and they have done so in their proposed regulations. And this is why it's maddening when they try to stuff this uh, stuff down your throat without any public comment. This stuff is actually, by statute, supposed to go through a process. So when regulations are proposed, they're supposed to be open for a period for the public to review. There's supposed to be a, a, a comment period where people who are for them or oppose them or whatever can make comments and, and, and suggestions. And then they go to the Office of Administrative Law where they are then reviewed and the OAL, Office Administrative of Administrative Law, is supposed to compare them to the statute and make sure that the proposed regulations are in line with the actual laws that were passed by the legislature and don't go beyond them or don't uh, do not do less than the laws intended. That's what they're supposed to do. And a lot of the times the OAL does a good job at that. Sometimes they don't. They just rubber stamp stuff. And we can't allow it to be rubber stamped this time around, which is what the DOJ wanted, which is why the California DOJ refused to provide copies of this for the public to review the only way that anybody ever got them was through the Office of Administrative Law. That office actually released them. And then once they were released and everybody got them, then DOJ finally relented reluctantly and published them. But they had no intention of doing so. And in fact, they had actually refused to provide them when requested. So they really wanted to shove these things through. So you should know if you have one of those shotguns, the actual legal changes do not include shotguns. However, DOJ is trying to add them and create law on its own through regulation, which it, by the way, has no legal authority to do. 
Now, the effective dates for registration and all these other things have not changed in these regulations are the same. Uh, the definition of fixed magazine as was crafted in the previous release of proposed regulations uh, is exactly the same. So essentially, they've said that it's a magazine that cannot be removed without disassembly of the action. And the example they gave was an AR type rifle where the rear takedown pin is removed and the action is then tilted upward or forward so that the action no longer functions, and then the magazine can be released. And they use that same description in these proposed regulations. So that would seem to tell me, and, it, and the attorneys at the NRA and California Rifle and Pistol Association seem to agree that the AR Maglock, the uh, Elemental Arms, California Compliant Lower, and California Compliant Rifle, I did a review on that, um, and some of these other products along those lines, the DFM magazine from Franklin Armory, all those things would then render the rifle uh, compliant with California law because you have to disassemble the magazine in order to, or disassemble the action rather, as they've described in order to change the magazine. So it no longer has a detachable magazine. The magazine is considered fixed by definition. So the rifle does not need to be registered, even though it still retains all of its offending features, the flash hider and pistol grip and like that. So those things would appear to be legal. The other thing that has not changed in any of these proposals is the idea of a featureless rifle. So your Mini-14, your Sega hunting rifle, uh, any of those kinds of semi-automatic rifles that do not possess any of the offending features, like a pistol grip or a collapsible stock or a flash suppressor or any of those kind of things, those things are all legal as featureless rifles. And if you want to take your AR-15 or your AR or your AK and change the stock and swap out the flash hider for a compensator and make it featureless, you can do that even under these newly proposed regulations, which are the same pretty much as the previous ones. And the rifle will then be featureless and it will not fall within the description of an assault weapon. And so therefore it does not have to be registered. Now that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my rifles featureless so that I don't have to worry about that. That's just my personal choice. Some folks have said they're going to register them. Some folks have said they're not complying. And uh, now here's a point I want to make to you just from one guy who feels that all of these laws are completely and utterly unconstitutional to another person who obviously you're watching this channel, I suspect, unless you work for the DOJ, uh, you probably feel the same. I'm my feeling is these laws are unconstitutional. Nevertheless, I think we all address them differently. And so if you choose not to comply, I have no criticism of that at all. That is your choice. It is civil disobedience. Many great things in this nation have come about as a result of people peacefully disobeying unconstitutional, unfair uh, laws. They just have. I mean, I think about Rosa Parks and others. I mean, the, the civil disobedience is what it is. And I have no problem with it. However, I do not choose to fight this battle that way. I choose to fight this battle by making my rifle featureless and by fighting these laws in uh, in the courts, by supporting organizations that are doing that, and by using my voice as the host of an internet channel and a podcast and the author of a blog to encourage other people to do likewise, and that is change maybe change their view of firearms and educate others and at the same time fight this battle legally to get the laws to change. I think both of us are fighting the battle. What I object to is the idea that folks who are not going to comply want to criticize me and others who refuse to fight the battle that way. Likewise, I don't think it's appropriate for those of us who choose to fight the battle a different way are critical of those who choose not to comply. If we're all fighting the battle, then we're fighting the battle. Understand that not complying, though, does put you at significant risk because you're not going to have 500 people marching on the Capitol not complying, probably. More than likely, what's going to happen is law enforcement is going to pick us off one at a time if we don't comply. So I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to comply with the law. I have too much to lose in the form of my business, my business licenses, my channel, all these other things that I can use to change the laws if I don't comply. So I'm going to comply so that I can fight the battle differently, so that you understand how I feel about that. All right, there you go. Uh, let's see. Under the firearms regulations, DOJs, uh, registration process, there are some uh, landmines. So I want to go over the landmines with you just so that you understand what they are, should you choose to register your rifle, which is uh, an option. Obviously, you want to register your rifle, you certainly can. I know people who are going to make a lot of them featureless, but they're going to register one 
so that they can use it to take classes and other things in California if they wish to do that. Well, that seems completely legitimate to me. And so if you choose to register yours for whatever reason, that's up to you. There are There's a process to do that. Now, it can be, like I said, it can be fraught with danger. So I want to make sure you understand what the dangers are. I didn't find them all, but I did find a few. All right, here's one. In the um, selection process of, of itemizing the features that your gun has, there is a menu apparently either on the online system to register or going to be on the online reg registration system where you, you tick the box. You check the box that says, okay, my gun has a flash hider. It has a, a pistol grip and whatever. You're tick ticking those boxes as you go. Well, here are the two of the choices that are listed, both of which are, are landmines. Uh, one is grenade launcher or flare launcher. Well, I just let me tell you, I would not check that box. I, I would encourage you to be very careful about checking that box because a grenade launcher in the state of California, as far as I am aware, is considered a destructive device and is already illegal to possess. And so if you check the box and I have a I have a grenade launcher on my rifle, you're liable to have black helicopters hovering around your house, black SUVs pulling up and people kicking down your door all dressed in black outfits with balaclavas and rifles and whatever because you have a destructive device in an environment in which people are concerned about terrorism and other things. So I don't know that I would check the grenade launcher box. So if your gun has a grenade launcher, you might want to talk to an attorney first before you do that. All right, here's the other one. Uh, one of the other choices is semi-automatic center fire with overall length of less than 30 inches. Oops, unless that's a, an AR pistol or something along those lines, that's a, that is already considered an assault weapon in the state of California, and it has been for a very, very long time, and it required uh, registration and licensing and like that before. So if it's not registered and licensed and whatever the requirements are now, and you tick the box, and confess essentially online that you have one, guess what? You just confess to a crime and same thing, black helicopters and all this other nonsense. And the next thing you know, you find yourself uh, in the Gray Bar Hotel wondering how in a devil you got there. Well, you got there because you checked a box in an application that threw up red flags all over, all over the place and the DOJ came and got you. So that's another way that that can happen. Uh, likewise, let me urge you, if you own a gun that should have been registered a long time ago as an assault weapon, the last time they required it, you know, many, many years ago, when the original assault weapons ban was passed and you had all these guns by name and manufacture and model like that, and you were supposed to register those. I got a phone call from the, a guy the other day, and I, I've had two or three emails from people say, I have one of these. Should I try to register it? And the answer is uh, absolutely not. No, if it's not already registered, don't try to register it now. If you do, you're essentially telling the world, including the California Department of Justice, that you have had for quite some time a gun that is a violation in this state, and you're going to be taken to task by uh, probably being arrested and prosecuted over that. Don't do that. So I'm going to give you the one and only way that you can do what you need to do legally with that gun. Get it out of Dodge. Remove it from the state, because if you keep it here and you're caught with it, or you try to register it, that's just not going to bode well for you. So I strongly suggest that you don't do that. Get it out of Dodge, take it someplace else, and get it out of the state of California. It certainly is legal other places, uh, but it most certainly is not legal here. So that's those are some minefields right there that you want to be aware of. All right, the other one that's caused a big fervor is the whole rimfire thing. Because as I read it, and as the California Rifle and Pistol Association attorneys in, uh, explained it, and I thought, okay, I didn't get that wrong, it looks as if that in the in the selection process as you're as you're going through the drop down menus registering online you're going to register your gun one of the choices is cartridge cartridge now why do they even have that there since they ask you the caliber anyway i don't get but and under cartridge are two options that as i could determine it one is center fire and the other is rim fire now first of all it's a stupid question since they already ask you what the caliber is and secondly uh, I mean, I guess it could be different, but nevertheless, secondly, rim fires are not included in any of this by statute. The California legislator, uh, legislature has not included rim fires in any description that I am aware of anywhere as assault weapons under California law. And they haven't done it with the latest laws that were passed. So your rim fire, I, I just reviewed two of them. The, uh, boy, excellent ones, as a matter of fact, the Franklin Armory, um, uh, F-17, which is a 17 Winchester Supermag. Wow, 
Wow, great rifle. Outstanding. And that is not an assault weapon in the state of California because guess what? It's a rimfire. Uh, Garrow Arms, Mike Garrow, makes a great upper for 17 HMR. In fact, I think he's the only one that does it. And it's it's really terrific. Again, you put that on your rifle, that's not an assault weapon because it's a rimfire. And rimfires are not included. Now, I, I cannot figure out, and it seemed to be pretty vague to the California Rifle and Pistol Association attorneys, whether DOJ is, by virtue of this, trying to include rim fires in this regulation or not. I wouldn't put it past them, but it's not terribly clear. And I know that's going to come up in uh, the battle with the DOJ regarding this regs. And, and remember, they were under a lot of pressure the last time. That pressure hasn't gone away. People are going to go after them about these regulations and where they're trying to create laws that don't exist. Uh, all right, uh, let's see. Requirement for photos is still vague. They did you have to submit four photos and they, they describe them, but they don't tell you, they say they have to be clear photos, but they don't tell you what constitutes clear. What's the background supposed to be like? What's the resolution supposed to be like? They did at least add um, some formats. So JPEG, uh, I think GIF, PNG, you know, they've added some formats that you can, you know, if it's that format, you can upload it, but they, they didn't give you, they don't give you any examples of photos to look at and go, oh, I got to take the picture like that. And they don't tell you anything about resolution. So it's a little bit vague. So you're liable to submit photos and have them kicked out because you have no idea and they're going to want you to take them differently or something. So be aware of that. Uh, it's a little bit like deal, dealing with the DMV. Anytime you're dealing with a state agency, particularly one that hates what you're doing, like the D, like the DOJ does. Uh, if you register a gun, make lots and lots and lots of copies of the registration. Make sure you keep one with the gun wherever you are. Make sure you have one in the safe with the gun. You know, there's all, lots of reasons to do that. If you have a contact with law enforcement somewhere along the line for one reason or another, you want to be able to prove that the gun is registered to you. It will save you so much time and aggravation. It is not. Okay, my dad was a cop. I've been around cops my entire life. I, a lot of my friends are police officers. I can tell you that cops are no different than anybody else. The overwhelming majority of police officers are good, honest, hardworking people trying to do a job which becomes more challenging and more difficult every day. They are not. Uh, bad guys. Now, are there knuckleheads in the law enforcement business? Sure, there's knuckleheads and fools in every industry, and we try to weed them out out of every industry, and that is also true in the law enforcement uh, industry. So you're going to run into some, but there aren't very many. That said, it is extremely difficult for cops to keep up on some of these knucklehead laws, these idiotic laws that the legislature passes. So it is entirely possible that a well-meaning police officer is going to arrest someone for something that that officer is certain is illegal when it isn't. And if it happens when it happens, it isn't going to be the first time. Police officers have arrested people for things they thought were illegal but turned out not to be. It, it happens. And I, and I think it's unavoidable. So the more you can prepare to make for that contact with law enforcement to demonstrate to that officer that, no, this rifle is 100% legal. And by the way, officer, here's my registration, the better off you are. So I want to encourage you to do that. Likewise, one of the pitfalls or landmines of this whole process is the, the idea of the joint registration, which you can do. So, for example, if I have a rifle that I register to me, but I do not jointly register it with my wife, and we're going to go to the range, and I've already put the gun in the car, in the case, in the trunk or something, or whatever, and she gets stopped by a police officer, and the officer becomes aware of the fact that the rifle is there somehow, and she's not with me, and that gun's not registered to her, she's in violation. So if you have a situation like that, I urge you to, to investigate the joint registration so that you can avoid those kinds of, of pitfalls where an honest law-abiding citizen ends up going to jail for some idiotic technicality that they weren't aware of. Be aware that the joint registration thing is a pain in the butt, but as far as I'm concerned, the whole thing's a pain in the butt. The whole thing is completely you know, unconstitutional, but it is what it is. If you choose to register, uh, the joint registration might be something you want to consider if you're in a uh, circumstance like the one I just mentioned. Uh, let's see, what are the other things I wanted to cover with you? Um, DOJ is extremely late getting this all ready. They were supposed to start working on making this registration process available to us in January. They, they, I mean, here we are, it's, it's almost June, and it still doesn't really wholly exist. Why am I telling you that? Because if you're going to register the firearm, you must register it before December 31st, 2017. Now, when I say that, I don't mean you must start the process before then, the registration must be 100% completed. That's my understanding. You're dealing with an agency that A, doesn't like you having the gun in the first place, 
and B is a, the, the, the Justice Department equivalent of the Department of Motor Vehicles. Be aware of the fact that the system is not going to work right. It's going to have hiccups and mistakes in it. You're going to submit your registration and your money, and they're going to keep the money and lose your paperwork. I Trust me, I deal with the Bureau of Security and Investigation, Investigative Services all the time for the training company that we own, and we own a security company, and I love them. They're great. And they really try to help, but they routinely lose paperwork and keep the money. They never lose the money. It's the state of California. So be aware of those things. that You're going to submit pictures, and they're not going to like them. They're going to want you to resubmit them and those other things. They're going to want more information. Or they're not going to like this, or that didn't go through, or whatever. What am I telling you? Start early. Don't wait till the last minute, because all of that nonsense needs to be resolved so that the registration is 100% complete on or before December 31st, 2017, or you cannot register that rifle and it becomes illegal and you better make a feature list really, really fast or get it out of the state. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, don't try to register anything, any firearm, if you have any doubts about your legal eligibility to own one. So if you think there's some cockamamie screwball thing that you've got in your history where you might, it just might, blow up on you if you try to register the gun. Don't do it. A couple of things you can do. Talk to a, an attorney but I, I and get some advice. Would, and I think the attorney will tell you don't do it. The other thing you might do is independently on your own, run a background check on yourself and see what comes up before you do that. Because if you try to register a firearm and it pops up that you are ineligible to own a firearm, you are a prohibited person who has just confessed that you're in the possession of a firearm. That's a felony. So there's, again, another landmine. Don't try to register a gun if you're not 100% sure that you can get through the registration process and not be bounced out as a prohibited person. If you have any question about that, please, please, please don't get yourself arrested because of some stupid thing. Figure it out, okay, ahead of time. Do a little background check on yourself if you're worried about that at all because the consequences of screwing it up are pretty darn high. All right, um, that's pretty much the highlights there. There are a couple more things I want to make sure you're aware of. One, the ammo regs are not out yet. There will be additional uh, regulations coming from the DOJ regarding ammunition. Uh, when those come out, uh, CRPA and NRA have said they will produce another webinar for that. By the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned this. I am going to put the links not only to the previous videos I've done that explain all a lot of these things in great detail since they haven't changed any. So you can watch those if you don't know the answers to a lot of questions. Please watch those before you send me notes because the answers are probably there. I'll also put the links to the CRPA webinars. I urge you to watch them. They're long. I mean, so you got to have the time and, you know, you got to and pour yourself a big cup of coffee because it, it can be pretty heady and, you know, difficult to parse through. I, I, at least I found it. So I'm not an attorney. I'm just an average blue collar guy. So you know, it's a, it's a, you really got to pay attention, take lots of notes. And I did, I showed you, you know, these are my notes. Okay. Uh, there are some legal cases and, uh, already involved in this stuff, and there are more coming, so that you know. Let me tell you the ones that we already have. Um, you are probably fully aware of Peruta versus the state of California. That's been back and forth in the courts a number of times. Now it's waiting for the Supreme Court to decide whether to accept it or not. And that's the case that is fighting for the restoration of our concealed carry rights uh, on a shall issue basis here in the state of California. Now they've kicked it, the Supreme Court has postponed it and kicked the can down the road three or four times already. And I've wondered why, and I've had a lot of people asking me why, and I don't know, I didn't know why until I watched an interview with, uh, with uh, Chuck Michelle, who's one of the NRA attorneys. And he said, and I quote, that you could teach an entire law class on the uh, the voting process that happens within the Supreme Court when they're trying to decide when to take a case. And let me tell you what he told what he what he explained because it was very enlightening. One is apparently you have to have five votes on the Supreme Court to win a case. We all know that. That's why like Heller was a five to four decision. But you have to have four justices who agree they want to hear a case before the court will take the case. So there's actually a voting process on whether to take the case, and you've got to have four out of the justices, four of them, that agree to take the case in the first place. And here's what happens. Let's say you've got justices who look at that case, and they feel that it's going to go a direction they don't want it to go. You've got the anti-gun lib justices who don't want Peruta to win, for example. They're going to vote against taking the case because they don't want to take the case in the current, with, the, with the makeup of the court the way it is because they're afraid it'll go away. They don't want it to go. All right, now here's the other side. Now you got justices who want Peruta to win, excuse me. <coughs> However, 
in polling other justices and talking about talking to them, they're afraid they don't have the five votes to win the case. If that's the case, they may vote against taking the case because they want to kick the can down the road and postpone it to see if they can sway that fifth member somewhere along the way or see if the courts uh, make up changes somewhere along the way so they can take the case down the road. That may explain why it has been kicked down the road a couple of times, because we obviously just had a big change in the in the court, because we had Neil Gorsuch just appointed to the court. And before that, it was a four to four thing. Well, we may have had uh, unanimous kicking it down the road because four of those justices don't want to hear the case. They want the lower court uh, ruling to stand because it goes against Pruitt. And four of those justices would like to have Pruitt win but they need the fifth justice. So it may be, may be well that they take it this time. If it gets kicked down the road again, we might say, well, gee, that's probably good because they know something that we don't. So that's how that works, at least as I understand it. So hopefully that's a little enlightening, enlightening for you. Now, more cases. There's Rupp versus Becerra, which is challenging the assault weapons ban in its entirety, the statute itself in California. There will be an additional lawsuit and additional legal challenges to these regulations that are just being proposed now. So those are on their way. They just couldn't do anything with them until the regulations had actually been proposed. Now that they have been, those are in the works. So look for those legal challenges that are coming soon. There's also uh, Duncan versus Bessetta, which is challenging the magazine restrictions in the state. All of them, all of the magazine restrictions, not just one little isolated thing. They're going after the state of California with regard to this magazine, uh, 10 round magazine limit and all these other limitations they put on Mac. So there is a lawsuit about that. Now, the other thing that came out the other day, I thought it was very interesting listening to the attorneys is, these guys are nuts, these people are not stupid. They know that some of these cases are not gonna succeed. And so they already have prepped backup cases to launch in case they don't succeed in one of these. This is a long battle. The NRA, CRPA, Gun Owners of California, Sam Paridi's working very hard over there. I mean, he has for years. I assume he still is. Uh, those folks are working really, really hard, along with the Second Amendment Foundation, another great organization you want to you want to support, to uh, to get these things all queued up. This is a long term battle. They're looking at it in a long term way. They're going after it in a very aggressive, forward stance. They're not being defensive anymore. It's too late for that. We're going after it in an aggressive way. So I want you to, to be encouraged by that. Please support NRA, CRPA, Gun Owners of California, the Second Amendment Foundation. Those groups are fighting very hard. And it is an uphill battle with some of these cases like the new ones. Uh, we have the Ninth Circuit Court, uh, Court of Appeals. Everybody calls it the Ninth Circus for a reason. It's a kangaroo court. The only thing it's missing is the kangaroo suits. And the chances are these things, even if we win, are going to be thrown out or changed by the Ninth Circuit, and they're going to have to be pushed up to the Supreme Court. Fortunately, because of President Trump, we have now a gun-friendly Supreme Court, at least to a degree, and we actually have a chance of winning some of these battles. Now, as I find out more information, I'll produce another video for you. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them. Understand, I am not an attorney. I went to college, but I didn't graduate because I never finished. I'm a reasonably smart guy, okay, but I'm just an average blue collar cat and I'm trying to figure this stuff out too. But I will try to answer them if I know. If I don't know, I'm just going to be honest and say, I don't know. But you can refer to the webinars the CRPA put on and to the previous videos I did, and that will get you some answers too. Thank you again for putting up with all this. I know this is tough stuff to watch. Uh, I appreciate your fighting the battle. Please continue to do so. And please continue to support us here at Gun Guy TV. You can do that in a host of different ways. Patreon is one. We've got some great premium content for you there. Uh, the Amazon store at gunguy.tv is another. It's just Amazon. So you're buying from Amazon. It's just that they pay us a little bit of a commission. If you want concealed carrier home defense insurance with a handgun, uh, I urge you to check out Second Call Defense. And if you decide to purchase that product or that service, please do it through our link, through our website, because they, we have an affiliate link with them, and that helps us out a little bit. And if you just want to throw a tip in the jar, you can do that at gunguy.tv uh, gunguy or gunguytv.com or .net. It'll all get you there. And there is a donate button on the upper right-hand corner of the website. Thank you again. Have a wonderful week, and please be safe.